For the Pew Charitable Trusts, I'm Dan LaDuke. In much of the industrialized world, it's easy to turn on the tap and get as much fresh water as we need. But from Flint, Michigan to Cape Town, South Africa, we're starting to see some disturbing trends. I had a conversation about the future of water with Jay Familietti, who heads the Global Institute for Water Security at the University of Saskatchewan, and Sandra Postel, the director of the Global Water Policy Project and author of Replenish, The Virtuous Cycle of Water and Prosperity. So changes are occurring in our water supply, and Jay Family Eddy, you literally have had a view of these changes from space. You wrote about your research in the latest issue of Pew's Journal of Ideas called Trend. So what's going on? We use NASA satellites to track how fresh water availability is, is changing all over the world. And what emerges from those satellites is a very geographically distinct picture of how freshwater availability is changing. Um, I guess the simplest way to put it is that the dry areas of the world are getting drier. Those are mostly in the mid-latitudes, and the wet areas of the world are getting wetter. That's the high latitudes and the, and the tropics. And sort of uh, spotted over that, uh, speckled over that pattern, if you will, are these areas for water insecurity that are driven by things like flooding and drought, which are on the rise, uh, glaciers melting, ice sheets melting, and groundwater depletion from the world's major aquifers. Now, water isn't disappearing. I mean, there's only so much in the world, and it, and it gets recycled and replenished. But Sandra, what's happening to the Earth's sort of natural water cycle? Well, we've sort of been disrupting it, you know? I mean, there is this magnificent movement that nature has done for us, you know, of moving, you know, water between the air, the land, and the sea, and then through the landscape. Um, and by virtue of the water engineering that's been very, very beneficial to us, you know, we've been sort of interrupting that cycle and, you know, blocking rivers and depleting aquifers and drying up wetlands. And so <clears throat> that natural, sort of magnificent movement and storage of water and cleansing of water that nature did um, on its own, we've, we've really interrupted and sort of broken those, those aspects of the water cycle. We've been talking about the industrialized world here, but we can't forget that 800 million people in this world still live without access to fresh water. All of these sort of changes that we're talking about that are global, what, what does it mean for folks like that? Yeah, you know, I, I, I see that, um, access to, to fresh water is changing, right? And it's changing disproportionately in the undeveloped part of the world, under, uh, undeveloped or underdeveloped nations, and within countries like the United States, for example, it's happening in poor communities. So it's a real, I mean, it's a real, it's a real humanitarian crisis, actually. Well, we, experts like yourselves call this water security, <laughs> which is uh, simply another way of saying that we, society needs to have the amount of water it needs when it needs it, right? But it sounds like water security is a lot less secure than most of us might take for granted. Um, how concerned should the average citizen be these days? Uh, so, you know, on the water security part, I think it um, uh, it's quite dependent on where you live and how concerned you should be and what you should be concerned about. In some places, it's purely water scarcity issue. In other places, there's issues of corruption or a lack of infrastructure. Um, so it, it, it varies. I think that everybody should be concerned about it, but it's really for different reasons in different places. Mm. Well, in your essay in Trend, Sandra, uh, and in your book, you describe places where the water cycle is being fixed. Um, what are some of the some of the examples of those, and and what are lessons do they sort of offer for us moving forward? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was the inspiring part of writing tre the trend essay and and my book is that there are a lot of great examples out there of of collaborative efforts where the water cycle is attempting to be fixed. Um, we can see, for example, uh, there's a river I've been you know uh, watching and and a little bit involved with. Um, uh, called the Verde River in Arizona, where you know an upgrade of of a very you know very old irrigation ditch system that had been operating the same way for 150 years, um, with with head gates that allowed irrigators to take just the water they need and leave the rest for the river. Changes in points of diversion in that system, so the river keeps water in it. 
and some switch, uh, switching of crops from you know really thirsty alfalfa to more water thrifty barley. You know those kinds of things are now keeping water in the river, and so it's not running dry anymore. Good for fish, good for birds, good for the community. They have more boating, birding, tourism opportunities, recreational opportunities, and good for the irrigators. They have a modern system. So that's a really positive sort of win-win-win. Um, that, that we can look to as, as, an, as a good example. And then at the national level, you have a country like China realizing it's, it's had enormous flooding in hundreds of its cities in recent years, um, and then followed by droughts. So they're trying to repair their urban water cycle. You know, they have these massive cities that are all, you know, basically impermeable uh, surfaces. The rains come and they just run off and flood. And so they're initiating a sponge city program, um, trying to you know, build in that natural infrastructure so that the rainwater soaks in, replenishes the soil and the groundwater, and reduces that, that flooding. So they've designated 30 cities as their pilot sponge cities to capture that stormwater. Uh, the bottom line is that we have to figure out how to um, live with less water, and that's, that's true around the, uh, around the world. Uh, we have to figure out how to produce water, uh, how to produce food more efficiently. Uh, we have to figure out in places that are water stressed how to, how to use less water in our homes. And that's, that's going to take some doing in some, in some countries in the developed world where the standard of living and the water standard of living is, is quite high. We seem to be at this sort of key moment in society where there's some of this realization going on. Um, what needs to happen in the next five years, for you, in your in your thinking, for us to see some progress? You know, to really make progress, I think we need to get our decision makers on board, and that means a grassroots movement from uh, from the bottom up uh, that really emphasizes how important water is is to us as individuals and as communities, and we need to. Uh, basically demand from our decision makers and from our elected officials that they have a plan to move forward and if, if they don't, uh, they won't get our votes. Mm. And Sandra, what do you hope to see happen in the next few years? You know, I think it's similar, really. Um, I, think, I think we really need um, strong civic engagement around water, uh, starting with our personal choices. Um, you know, we, we, there's a lot of changes we can make in our personal lives that magnified by, multiplied by hundreds of millions of people can make a difference. Um, but I think that civic engagement, the realization that, you know, we all have to take, step up and, and get involved in this water uh, story because we can change the course of the story if we get involved and we can't if we don't. So I think that civic engagement is, is super important. Well, Sandra Postel and Jay Family Eddy, thank you for this conversation. Thank, thank you. you, Dan.